so uh, first of all, I have to, to disclose that uh, since we connected last time, you had a great influence. Your awakening from, from, from the Midland Crisis series had a great influence on, on me and on my research as well. And with the information that you shared, you kindly shared, and it was very helpful because it expanded my vocabulary and also mm. uh, expand, gave me other different perspective from where to look at specific problems as uh, meaning, mm -hmm. ins insight, concepts of meaning in life that watching to your series and, and taking uh, information from you, I, I had the opportunity as well to talk to other people about the, the, the about meaning and meaning in life. Yeah, you got to talk to Susan Wolf. I saw you talk to Susan Wolf, which is amazing. You talked to Anderson Todd. That's great. Yeah, Anderson Todd was a good conversation as well. And the conversation you had with Anderson Todd, uh, you have published not a long time ago, was just great, great. Because, oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, because Jung, I, I mean, I, I, Jung is very complex, very complex mm. to read and understand. Yeah, Sometimes yeah, yeah. people like us, we do just, we just, we try to get things here and there and we create this concept. Sometimes we are not, is not very well understood because you haven't gone through the literature properly from yeah. the literature. And you, right. you guys just put me like, put this thing like very nicely. Oh, thank you for saying that. Thank you for everything you said, Leandro. That, that's, yeah. I'm glad to hear, uh, really glad to hear that my work is, uh, so helpful to you. Um, that's that, that's what I want to do. That's what that's the goal I'm trying to achieve. <laughs> that's great. That's great. And the conversation today, I I purposefully try to to leave it as structured, unstructured as possible. And mm -hmm. when I I firstly contacted you about this conversation, um, just to give the, the the listeners a bit of background, we're talking about the um, I practice martial arts, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yes. And connecting to, to, to the conversations you had with other people as well. We were speaking about uh, your, your, uh, speaking about uh, your experience with martial arts as well, mm -hmm. about the wisdom and meaning, meaning, meaning in life. My question would be, I will open this, like, leave it very open-ended, mm -hmm. for a martial arts that is very focused on combat competition mm. that it comes from 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 a complete system of martial arts a complete system i mean just not martial but as a, a way of living um, and that is losing it may be because it's specialized in combat sports and self defense there are elements that it may not it may be losing like uh, uh, being a tool for transformation, meditation, and quest for wisdom. Mm. My question would be how, without having to, to just take something and copy from other style, what would be the principles or the elements necessary for a martial arts be a complete system to still being a system of attack and defense and competition, but also a tool for meditation, a tool for quest for meaning in life, gaining of in wisdom <coughs> and transformation. Mm. That, oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I guess uh, there's a couple of things. Um, first of all, I, I would, I would I generally talk about trying to cultivate an ecology of practices, and I, you might have seen some of the discussions I have had with Rafe Kelly around that, in which the martial arts are integrated with parkour practices and uh, movement practices and discourse practices. Um, so uh, <coughs> I suppose there's two ways of answering this question. One is extensively. Sorry. <coughs> All of a sudden my throat went dry. Mm. Um, extensively would be, um, well, one of the things you might want to consider is situating uh, your combat practice uh, within 
uh, some um, like mindfulness practices, some discourse practices, some other movement practices, <clears throat> and, uh, like parkour, like Rafe does, um, or some of the stuff that I'm doing uh, uh, with Mike Nayan about you know trying to situate uh, a martial art within a broader con a broader cur curriculum of trying to teach people um, various aspects of cultural understanding and personal transformation. So one thing would be, uh, can you situate it? And then if you if you do that, then you've got to you got to think about some very important questions. One is you want to you want to look for you want to look for compensatory relationships between the practices, right? The, what are their respective strengths and weaknesses, and how can I properly align them? And you need you need <coughs> sorry about this. You need mediating practices. So, like, like an example I, I take from Rafe is that you have martial art practices, right? And then you have movement practices. And then you have moving mindfulness practices, and then you have seated mindfulness practices, and then you have sort of sh shared mindfulness practices. And you see how they all overlap and they mediate between each other. They're structured so that there's an ecology that mediates. They can speak to each other. They can constrain, inform, uh, make each other more insightful. So I would think uh, my first, uh, the first answer is the extensive answer. Try to uh, cultivate an ecology of practice and, like I say, look for com compensation compensatory relations of strength and weakness, and that look for mediation relations so that they overlap, inform, mutually constrain, and talk to each other. Then there's the intensive answer. The intensive answer is try to explicate uh, the implicit knowledge you're developing. Um, so one of the ways in which I, one of the ways in which this became apparent to me, and and so I'm going to recommend something a minute, um, uh, is to, to go from doing a martial art to trying to teach somebody else how to do it. Uh, because then what you have to do is you have to go from an intuitive, implicit understanding of that, that, that participatory knowing of your, of, of, of your body, what we're like, right? Uh, the way you're knowing, you're knowing of it and through it and the way that's connected to your perspectival knowing the, the, how you're sizing up the situation, salience, landscaping, things, right? You have to go from just running that intuitively, implicitly, and you have to step back and try and sit, try and learn. How would you try to describe that state, that knowing to somebody else? What would, what, how would you try to describe how to go from not being in that state to being in that state? So the intensive strategy, which often helps through trying to teach someone else, what that state is like and how to enter into that state, you want to take, you want to have an ex, you, you want to have a, an intensive strategy of explication where you're making it explicit. You're bringing conceptual awareness to it. You're trying to trace out the processing. You're trying to break up your overall gestalt of movement into, you know, uh, you know, the, the relevant components and, and how they're integrated together because that explication of your otherwise implicit and intuitive knowledge. And if you can put it into conceptual form, what people then, then can do, this is about sort of construal level. When you get that sort of more abstract conceptual representation, you can then transfer it to other aspects of your life. You can say, okay, I know what this feels like. I know what this is like, and I now know how to get into it, but not just intuitively, implicitly, but I have a, a how might I, this is what I do. And then think about how, think about, again, the mediation idea. So I'm teaching the martial arts, right? So I'm doing that explication. But then I ask myself, how do I bring that flow, right? And that, that kind of situational awareness and that awareness into my teaching, my academic teaching? How do I transfer it? Because, you know, and that, so if you think about it, the, these two strategies, the extensive and the intensive, then talk to each other. Because, right? Because notice, I get the intensive strategy of explication, and then if, when I get a, a, a sort of an optimal grip on that, I can start to transfer it to other areas of my life. And when you start doing the transfer, right, that will then start to talk also to you setting up an ecology of practices. And then you can get that whole thing organized towards transforming your sense of self, your sense of world, your sense of meaning, as opposed to just, um, you know, you know um, your sense of combat. That's very interesting. Um, in, in terms of... Ba background in, on res resources. Uh, mm -hmm. What would be the the first like the first line of resources that I can go to in terms of learn uh, or get inspiration? How 
what the so process I, I, I should follow. So, I mean, I, I, I've, I've, I've tweeted about this and I recommend. Uh, Ray Kelly's put out an online course. He's got videos where he's trying to show, and he's done one recently where he tries to explain how you put together these ecologies of practices in the ways that you and I have been talking about. Um, I think you you want to you uh, you uh, you also want to track down individual resources that are, are you know geographically uh, convenient to you for you know attending a good mindfulness group, uh, taking up a, a, some kind of movement practice. Um, the other thing is to uh, you might want to take a look at um, some of the online dialogical practices I've been engaging in uh, with Guy Senstock, especially the guy who invented circling. And I did one recently with Edwin Roosh. Um, and so uh, you could get an idea of what that looks like. Um, and, and, and you could start to read some of the literature on circling. <clears throat> so um, I don't, I don't want to be too specific because the, the particular ecology of practices and the particular places, but that's, that's what I would recommend. You are going to vary depending on where you are. But I, I recommend, you know, I think Rafe's work is a good sort of initial starting point. Um, Mark Walsh has a book out. I think it's, oh, I, oh, I, I'm, oh, oh I want to remember. His, I think it's not Beyond Mindfulness. And it's all about embodiment. Uh, Mark Walsh's book is excellent. I've co I read it and commented on it. Um, so that is a very valuable resource. I hope I get. I'm hoping getting the name uh, of the book right. Uh, I hope uh, Mark, if I got it wrong, I, I apologize. Um, but his book um, is, is is fantastic. So that that's some initial places places to start. Oh, that's great. What is circling about? Um, so circling, I got involved with circling because of the work I'm doing with Peter Lindbergh. Because uh, and what I'm, the the work I'm doing is towards the next series I'm working on, uh, the the After Socrates series, the Pursuit and Cultivation of Wisdom Through Authentic Dialogue. And circling is one of these modern practices. It was invented by Guy Sandstock, who's a good friend of mine, brilliant guy, brilliant. Um, and what circling is is a way of trying to change what we're doing here discourse into something that has a lot of important features that you see in sort of Socratic uh, dialogue. It's much more about trying to use conversation, not just as a way of transmitting information, but a, a, a way for two people to really get, as Guy says it, really get each other's world, really, so that I'm not just getting information from you. I'm much more. It's much more important to me in the conversation uh, to create a dynamic sense of mutual opening. I'm getting how you're seeing me, and you're getting right how I'm seeing you, and we're using that to connect more deeply through many different levels of our mind and body to each other. So we develop a tremendous sense of connectedness and a con because because. Uh, uh, this sounds sort of trivial, but it's really uh, actually central. The transformations that we're often seeking in conversation are not fundamentally transformations of belief. They're transformations of our sense of self, our sense of how to be with other people, our perspectival knowing, our participatory knowing. And so circling is a way of trying to reformulate how you practice conversation. So instead of giving an emphasis on giving people propositions, obviously you're speaking, but what you're primarily trying to do is create something like this mutual flow between you and other people. So you're trying to tap into, right, sort of the emergent collect, the emerging collective intelligence between people, the intelligence within distributed cognition rather than within individual brains. You know the way like the internet networks computers together, you're trying to network brains together so they're forming this sort of, uh, you know, di distributed cognition, a dynamical system. And and that's what you're ultimate, that will ultimately afford a deeper kind of tra transformation in people than just trying to convince them of particular conclusions within argumentation. Now, what I want to do is I want to understand how to take something like circling and then reintegrate it back in with argumentation, because so Socrates was able to do both. He was able to create that sort of mid, we called it midwifing, you know, helping people to give birth to themselves, right, And which was always deeply connected to his own project of self-knowledge. So he's doing that, but he also did it within the context of argumentation, which is, again, not directed towards winning. 
It's so what you're trying to do is use the connectedness between you and me and then bring that into an argumentation that is directed towards getting us more deeply connected to wisdom, virtue, reality. It's very interesting and uh, something related to martial arts. So that I I had been noticed and after the, the conversation with you and, and the information that you have been sharing, uh, something that uh, Anderson Todd and you, we spoke about uh, um, on the hero's journey mm -hmm. and it happens as well uh, working in competition on combat you your your it's it's let's see how i put it because i have to say it very carefully as well because when when you have a a young athlete starts mm -hmm. a a sport in general mm -hmm. so the is because he's young because for being the best, he will try, he will she will try to be the best as possible in this mm -hmm. sport and as good as he he or she can be. So we'll try to be the best. You know? mm -hmm. And being the best, so you're you're trying to win. So your 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 focus and your goals is winning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's getting from point A to B and to be the best. But then. There is one element that I believe that it stays out, but it's it, the, the motivation and the meaning in in the, the the practice itself would be becoming the best. But compared to other people, compared to, to a set number mm. of elements, but not necessarily, not necessarily will be being my best of myself. Yes, These things, yes, they yeah. may be connected sometimes, but, but yeah. not intentionally. I had experience, well, I will rephrase it. I believe that they, you can try to be the best of yourself in a specific trade or the best on, in, in one sport, but not necessarily you may... You will not necessarily be transformed in the best being you can be. Yes, I agree with that. And I think that's a very good point that Anderson brought up. And uh, thank you for pointing that out. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and that's interesting because, and that has to do and uh, with, you know, uh, the degree to which we, how should we take the hero's journey uh, within the martial arts? And um, I know Rafe Kelly is, again, doing work on this explicitly. Um but what, what, what you said, uh, what you said, brings out a really important point, and that goes towards something I've been doing quite a bit of work on recently, um, which is uh, trying to work, but try to build on the work of L.A. Paul and transformative experience and Agnes Callard in aspiration, right? Where you may think that there's 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 if you'll allow me, there's sort of uh, 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 this way in which you can frame the hero's journey. I'm going to defeat all of my opponents. I'm going to defeat all of my peers, right? Um, but there, you could also think of the hero's journey a, as an aspirational one, which is there's a future self that I want to be. That, and I'm not currently that self, right? This is a self that, uh, you know, has perspectives and virtues and pre uh, and preferences that I don't have. This is perhaps a wiser self, or a more rational self, or a more virtuous self. And that's a different that's a different hero's journey because now the relationship is between your current self and your future self, and it's it's a very different thing because the skills you need to build are not just the skills of combat or the skills. Let's call them the skills of victory. You need to you need to build up these important skills that take like I'm 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 this agent right now in this particular arena. This is this is who I am and this is how I see and understand the world. And I want to be that person. If you'll allow me to use space to refer to time, right? I want to be that person over there, a different person living in a different world. This is why people go into therapy, right? They want to be a different person in, living in a different world. They want to right, and so. The skills of get the skills of moving between worlds in this existential sense of a world are not the same skills as combat. They are not the same skills as as combat. You as a, and I agree with you. I think you can develop your skills of combat and be best in that sense. But if you have not engaged 
in a lot of the processes that I talk about, the inactive analogy, anagoge, the serious play. I, this is all in my series for people who want to take a, a deeper look at these ideas. But if you don't cultivate these skills, let's call them the skills of transformation that transframe you from one world to another, you can have your combat skills at a very high level. And that doesn't mean you've aspired very much at all, right? Um, so I agree with you that if people are trying to incorporate the hero mythos into their martial practice, they should sit down and reflect, well, which way do I want it? Do I want it this way? I, you know, I just want to be able to defeat my contemporaries. Is that the hero's journey on, I'm on? Or is the hero's journey, right, I want to... I want to move to that person in that world. And then, because then what you have to do is you have to do what we were talking about earlier, Leandro. You have to think about cultivating all of these other things so you can develop the skills of transcendence and transframing, not just the skills of combat. And follow up on this, and think, thinking about my previous experiences as well, and you... you, you you think that you you have you have said the the if um, and I, I I'm going to take myself an, as actually as an example for instance please like, please at some point of my life I now now I'm, I'm married and but before before being married and in another relationship uh, at some stage of this, not only this relationship, but the relationship didn't go very well, and mm -hmm. it broke apart. And at this specific moment, I had to, to look at my life on things that, what have I been, have, have, what, what, I, what I'm doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And in this question, with this question, what what went wrong with this relationship? Then, right. okay, you can blame other people. Try to blame other people unconscious. No, no, someone someone else is not my brain. Then you realize, no, 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 it's, it's, it's your fault. It's your fault. Mm. There are things that are, are your fault are my fault. So, then realize, okay, there are things that I can improve. Then the question after was, okay, how can I improve these elements that I have? identified and it started from that okay so what type of experiences or knowledge I need mm. in order to improve these and these and these and these right exactly exactly and from this moment it took me a few years actually to from this because and there was a go there the, the in this specific a case there was a like, okay there's a there's a relationship that doesn't work uh it's my fault the few the next relationship i want to improve these things and to be a better person to, for this specific relationship so what elements i need for this and then yeah. starting this quest yeah. okay i should learn yep. this this and this but in no in no occasion is okay i have to be be better than this you know i don't need to be better than anyone else i don't have to compare to compare myself to anyone else but just no. to my previous and be future next self yes. future self yeah exactly i think that's exactly right yeah and so uh, and and then and then i mean you didn't stop being a martial artist so an in interesting question for me is I, I, I expect that the role of martial arts also changed in your life because it's like, how can I connect the martial arts to these other things that I'm uh, trying to, how could, like that I'm trying to cultivate because I have all these skills and abilities in martial Can they teach me something? Can they, you know, can they maybe help? Like, I expect that possibly what you did is that you start to transfer. Well, that's what you see people doing. They start to, tr they start to transform how they're doing something that's already important because you don't just give up when you're like, it's like, okay, I'm going to keep doing this, but if I'm going to be a different person, my attitude and relationship has to be different because here, here's what I'm saying. 
if I want to become that person over there, and let's say martial arts are really important to me, I have to deal with my relationship to something that's really important to me, or else I'm not going to get to being that person over there. Because this is so much a part of me, and if I'm trying to transform me, that means I've got to transform how I'm relating to the martial arts. And I, I think um, I, I think that's an, that's that's an, just an important sort of thing that people have to do. They have to shift. Um, what what did you get? In, did you get any like? Did it start to talk? Did the two projects start to talk to each other? Was what I'm saying. As you just as you took on this aspirational course of, of I'm going to become the kind of person who who can enter into a deep and successful relationship. Did you did you start to notice different things and how you're interacting with people, even within martial arts, for example? Did that start to change? Did you start to get any kind of sense of the two talking to each other? Okay, so I will have to give you more background in order to to, to position it. It, but I started at this specific. I, I started. I started martial arts in this specific in this specific momentum of my life. Because, oh, so yes, oh, wow. yeah, okay, okay. So, oh, so, that's, that's okay. even better. Okay, yeah. so so I, I will tell you. I will, okay, let me just think how I can put it. Okay, when I realized, okay, something went wrong, and it was my fault most my fault it was my fault and then i had to look at myself okay what's missing or what's wrong and from this question uh, and for the context of martial arts for i realized that there is a level of uncontrolled aggressiveness on ah. me that ah. has to be tamed Right, somehow right. or controlled and in this specific aspect and excellent, excellent. and then okay so martial arts may be a solution mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then i thought and the thing and my 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 belief at this moment as well and it really, it really has changed a little bit. Okay, martial arts are the arts of Mars. So there's nothing yeah, beyond yeah. the art of Mars and martial arts. That it is for. <laughs> this right, was right, my right. belief at this point. So what's the most... Then I felt, okay, what's the, 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 the most eff eff efficient martial arts? Uh, they say, oh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So I'm going to do this and see if I learn something in order to control this. So how, that's how I started doing martial arts, but but just keeping with martial arts. So over time, then you start, I start realizing more recently. Um, I said and, and also I also practice practice traditional judo sporadically as well. Then I started realizing talking to you. So I, I I realized okay, there's some elements here that we focus. We are competi competition focus, performance, focus, which bring, it bring meaning in life. Mm -hmm. bring, it's a certain meaning yeah. in life. And the conversation that I had also with, with Dr. Richard Ryan, because as I was asking questions, asking him questions, I realized after this conversation, okay, my all my perspective is in, in sports, in motivation is extrinsically motivated is not ah, intrinsically motivated. Right, right, yeah, right. he said, he said, no, 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 one point, he said, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. No, no, you have to come from inside. Ah, you can, ah, the higher ah. quality. So, yes. Oh, so that's perfect. That's exactly what I'm talking about, right? So you start with it and you, you, you sort of learn some very practical self-control, but then you get this really Socratic moment of insight. You get a mo you get a moment of self knowledge that your motivation is extrinsic rather than intrinsic, and then you want to go through a, a deeper kind of transformation to get a more intrinsic motivation. That's yeah. amazing. Yes, yes. So in my research, because apart from doing and practice martial arts, my researching is uh, effectiveness. Uh, how how good you can be according to your, to your, of course, your abilities in terms of someone that doesn't do it full time or someone that does do full time professionally. How how efficient you can be in the martial arts and in terms of of the 
the theoretical side of martial arts is strategy. What's mm -hmm, the strategy? Mm -hmm. But strategy, very, very martial, folks. Let me see if I get like some some resources that I I got like a let me, this book uh, 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 in Spanish, the, the 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 art of war. This Chinese ancient book. There's another the, the another book. Sun Tzu. Yeah, yeah. There's Sun another Tzu. book. The the a Japanese ancient book. There's some. Books the of book of five rings. Military, yeah, military yeah. strategy. That's yeah, that's yeah. the this was my concept mm -hmm. of martial arts in the strategy. So, and after all this conversation that I have been having during the past eight eight months and some some research I, I do as well with with uh, Hinduism, uh, the Upanishads, uh, Buddhism, mm. as well, and and practicing some elements of meditation, uh, breathing. Uh, mm. So I realized that so much, there's so much more out, out there. And mm. also traditional uh, traditional judo and like researching a little bit about uh, jiu-jitsu, you know, there, there are other elements other than martial. If it's, it's like the, 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 let's say the, the samurai, the samurai, mm -hmm. he would need like some, some spiritual practice, practice that wouldn't take so much time. Let's say, okay, you, you stay here, you, 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 an analogy, mm -hmm. you light a candle, but it won't take those so much time because your focus, yes, would be on becoming technically best. However, this, this martial arts, which is like competitive combat focus, and it is very popular, very popular at the moment. It mm. lives outside. It is specific for a, a or some personality type or types, mm -hmm. but there and lifestyle as well, and mm -hmm. stage of life. If you are 18 years old, you, you're you are an alpha male and you are strong, and of course you are going to to destroy everything. But how about you're 50 years old? If yeah, yeah. how about yeah. you you can practice. Not 12 hours, 20 hours per week, but uh, only four hours per week. How about that? Mm. You 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 mm. don't want or you can't practice this this mm. combative, but you still want to to learn to transform your life. So this these are the questions that I'm I'm wrestling with. I think those are excellent questions. I like to thank you for sharing that because that was a very helpful sort of case study of you know that that kind of shift that I I, I was interested in. That's very good. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to talk about your next video series? I'm very curious about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so let, let's build on what we were talking about earlier. Right? We're talking about these this ecology of practices. Yeah. Right. And then in discussions I've had with Jordan Hall, he said to me, well, you actually you actually, you actually said you need sort of a meta psychotechnology that is going to help you, you know, choose and select and curate and coordinate your ecology, sort yeah. of shepherd your ecology. Uh, and that was like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And then I said, well, the primary thing it needs to do is it needs to do something analogous to what, you know, so we have practices that take individual intelligence and sort of you know, ratchet them up into rationality and then ratchet them up into wisdom. We need a practice that's going to take collective intelligence and lift it up into collective rationality and collective wisdom, because that collective wisdom will give us the guidance we need for ecologies of practices. And then I thought, well, wait a sec. I know of such a practice in the ancient world. It was the platonic notion of dialectic. Dialectic was kind of a meta psychotechnology in which uh, you did, and this, it, you know, it has to do with Socrates, which is what we were talking about earlier. You use this sort of looping between you and I. Remember, we were talking about that, what's going on in circling. But you also have this thing where you're trying to get deeply, more deeply aware of yourself, deeply aware of the other, and then they're using that to try and get a deeper understanding of you know what it, what is wisdom what is what is it to be in contact with reality where well, you 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 really try to again in dialogue using collective wisdom you try to get the the, the deepest kind of transformations of your awareness and of, of who and what you are possible so that, that that's what dialectic was dialectic was in the neoplatonic tradition it was both something you did individually in sort of a contemplative meditative way and then you did it dialogically with others and so it was this way of trying to 
coordinate dialogue such that you could deeply improve self-knowledge, knowledge of the other. So you get more deeply connected to yourself, more deeply connected to others. And then together we get more deeply connected uh, to how reality itself is unfolding. The idea is the way a conversation sort of unfolds, the way it opens us up, gives us deep clues into how reality is unfolding and opening itself up. And so what I thought was the following. There's been a lot of good work on what was happening around Socrates because he's the, he's, the, he's the hero of this practice, right? And so what I thought is, well, I'm going to truly really, really try to understand Socrates and the people that immediately came after him and how they, especially the Neoplatonic tradition, how they developed this practice of dialectic. And then once I get it clear, and so I'm going to do episodes on that, try to get really clear on what that is. And I'm going to use that as a template. And then I'm going to bring it into dialogue with all these emerging practices like circling, empathy circling, authentic relating, the anti-debate of Peter Lindbergh, you know, insight dialogue that came out of, a, of the Buddhist tradition. There's all these emerging practices of discourse on authentic relating. And then what I want to do is I want to take the Socratic template and integrate it with the current practices and try and make something that would be powerfully effective as a meta-psychotechnology for helping to curate the ecology of practices in response to the meaning crisis. That's okay. what I'm trying. Very interesting. And uh, follow-up question is, is this related to the concept that you're exploring religion of no religion? If yeah, it's very much, very much. I think that, um, uh, I, I don't know what kind of, the sort of dialectic dialogue, right, uh, that I'm, I'm trying to get at, um, is going to be needed uh, very much uh, for what Jordan Hall and I are talking about in the religion that's not a religion, because we're not trying to found a religion. Uh, I keep saying that so people don't get confused. What, 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 what we see is the following. We see that in response to meaning crisis, you have all these new emerging practices. You have all these new emerging practices. You have all these new emerging communities. You have all these new these ways in which people are experiencing, even individually, like yourself, Leandro, they're experiencing a kind of turning that's spiritual in a sense, but not necessarily tied to any particular organized religion. This is happening more and more and more. We need a way for people to talk to each other so they can network, so they can coordinate, and so they can compare and contrast and facilitate each other's ecologies of practices. That's what this kind of dialectic dialogue would do for us. It would, be, it, it, would, it, would, it would get us a way to, the, what we need is we need, we, need, we need forms of dialogue that cut through the bullshit and the self-deception so that we can start making the kinds of connections that make a new culture. Because a new culture is trying to be born, and this is a way of trying to help that happen. And it's, not, it's going to be very different uh, from both the failed ideologies, I would hope, of the past and... It, it's, it would, I, I think it'll be different, although there'll be deep continuities, but it'll have some important differences from the axial age religions that most people now find non-viable. Okay, so at this point, I, I do have to ask this question, but more for, my, for the listeners as well, because I, I thought about this and I, he I heard you comment. And forgive me if I'm asking you that other people, they ask, ask you a couple of times. That's, that's fine. If I I understand their concept, however, however, there is there are established religions with a long yes. long history that they yes. they 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 did or they try to address these same questions in in, in another yes. way. Why not use? Uh, and I will make a note. Why not not use them as a basis? For yeah, instance, yeah. as well, we have the concepts of yana yoga, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, no action, action, meditation, devotion. That yeah. there, you see these elements in other religions that can be uh, used as well. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and I answered this question. I'm quite happy to answer it again. By the way, I answered this question in my recent question and answer. Uh, Paul Vanderclay seemed to like it, but. When I when I saw him playing it, I, I like it, but I think it needs to be improved. There's, in one sense, the like, I I I think it's very much the case that individuals can turn to a religion and enter into a transformative relationship with it, right? Such that they can cultivate wisdom, enhance connectedness, meaning in life. I yes, 
Yes, they can. There is no can. question. Okay. So what I what? But there's two things we also have to pay attention to. But there is a growing number of people, the nuns, the N O N E S, for which that is not the case. They do. They right. They they find that they, they it's just not viable to them. It doesn't catch. It doesn't take. It doesn't work for them. And this leads me to the second point. Part of what I think, and I tried to give a long argument for this in the series, is that that, that, that a lot of the established religions came out of the axial revolution, right? And Christianity is much later, but it makes use of a lot of the axial ideas of ancient Greece and ancient Hebrew uh, cultures, right? And the, the thing about the axial age religions is they have this two worlds mythology, right? There's the real world or the illusory world there's the heavenly world or the decayed world right there's nirvana some sort like there's all there's the, this contrast now the the thing about it is the history the, right the history of the west i would argue since you know maybe the 12th century has been a whole bunch of processes have undermined that two worlds idea so that most people find the two worlds way of thinking and talking um, that is, is sort of prevalent, it doesn't link up with the, you know, the, the scientific, historical worldview that, in which they dwell. So, and, and think about what we're doing now. Like, you're in a different part of the world than I am. And we're relying on very sophisticated technology and and you know and our you know and we're coordinating it all with lo very sophisticated ai right that's making and 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 like all of this and and let and let and let me really deepen that point we are natural born cyborgs this is andy clark's point across many species we have evolved to deeply integrate with technology we uh, we we don't just use technology we identify it and internalize it uh, right and so this, it, this, this whole historical process that has been happening across centuries is now seeping into people's, seeping into people's bones, right? And, and let, me, let me give an example. Everybody thinks that it's just natural to talk about, well, my unconscious, right, and blah, blah, and this. Well, I don't, you know, maybe unconsciously. I, like, that's all Freud. You don't talk that way before Freud. But you, don't, you probably have never read Freud. And, 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 but and, you know, and and but for, but Freud has insinuated a way of thinking, and you know, and, and that way is also Freud at least thought it was because he thought of himself as an atheist. It was sort of linked to a particular understanding of the scientific worldview. I'm not saying Freud is right. That's not my point, Leandro. What I'm trying to show is that our cultural cognitive grammar has made for made many people incapable of acting within the two worlds grammar of the axial age religions. They, 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 they can't sort of, it does, they, 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 they feel that it's sort of a performative contradiction. Like the, and that's, and, and, and let's be very clear about this. That's not because like, you know, they've all become sort of hard nosed, rational atheists. They'll, they'll, they'll believe in w w strange and wonky things and they're very hungry for spiritual experience and they, they're, they're liable to experiment with psychedelics. But they, they somehow find that that way of thinking, that fundamental grammar is moribund for them. And so that's, right, that's why they are turning to generate. We need to be able to explain why all this generativity, why are people generating all these new practices, all these new ecologies of practices, all these new communities of practice. My explanation is the one I just gave you. And so for all of those people, we need something that is, it, what, and what I mean by religion is it can't be an axial age religion, and that's what people mean by religion, whatever else we mean by religion. But it can't be not a religion. It can't be the secular alternatives, like the, the pseudo-religious ideologies that drench the world in blood. So it can't be an axial religion, and it can't not be a religion the way, the, the way Marxism and Nazism are n not religion. So it has to get beyond both of those in order to help these people. That's what I mean. That's a very interesting conversation. Thank you very much. We are going to finish now. Uh, it's a great. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I hope being able to talk, talking to you within, I don't know, other six months, within six months' time, I don't know, to carry I, on I'm, this I'm conversation. Happy to, I'm happy to come back. Um, 
uh, and talk to you again, Leandro, that would be uh, fantastic. I, I would I would very much like that. Um, so uh, yeah, consider it done. We'll just set it up and make it happen. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Very much. Bye -bye. Thank you for sharing your story with me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Take. I'm I'm going to disconnect now. Bye bye. Bye bye.